There we go. Well, greetings, everyone. Uh, this is session two of uh, Dickens England, part one. And um, today, the topics we're going to look at are London and class as related to Oliver Twist. But first, as I'm always want to do, I'll give you a little bit of context. Less than last week, I won't talk as long. Um, and I won't shortchange Doc and our discussions of, of the novel. No worries. No so worries. Right. So here we begin. Um, you know, that people often think about the, the Industrial Revolution as something that's in the 19th century. And it, of course, it, it isn't. You know, I just selectively made a list of a few items here just to show you. I mean, you can talk about the early 1700s, long before the American Revolution, when England is beginning to transform itself. So the transformation into an industrial power is, is long before the um, American Revolution, and it is a, a gradual process. And I think gradual process is, is a good phrase to keep in mind tonight when we talk about several big topics that will impact uh, Victorian England, impact um, Charles Dickens. So um, the Industrial Revolution. You know, again, I just kind of randomly picked a few of my favorites. The uh, first steam engine, um, you know, the railroads. And fun fact I'll throw in, I, I don't want to digress too much, but they were actually developing a combustible engine as well. I mean, there was an early model of a car actually wow. about the same time. And it was a race between inventors as to which was going to catch. And um, the people backing the railroad uh, had more money and so they won um, and they buried the car for, for a long time. What so, fuel were they gonna use? I'm sorry? What fuel were the... Um, it was steam first, no, not, they weren't into gasoline, you know, they hadn't yeah. done the whole oil thing yet, but yeah. steam was the first engine. Okay. Um, so um, first factory is in 1719 and the weaving machine of course is a big one. And, um, and that's why textiles will be a, a, the number one export for Great Britain for a very long time. Um, first locomotive is 1801 and um, you know, they've, they've got a, an important railway by 1825. Now I mentioned here in 1811, the Luddites. And the Luddites were uh, people who were craftsmen who were, could build beautiful um, muskets hand-built and maybe they could turn out uh, two or three muskets a month if they worked hard. But factories are gonna be able to produce hundreds of muskets or and eventually rifles in days. Um, and so the Luddites are gonna sit, lead a series of riots opposed to industrialization and make all kinds of arguments. But of course, they're, they're not gonna win. And, and here's uh, just a, a brief quote um, revealing, I think some of Dickens' feelings about uh, industrialization. And it comes from one of his novels. So it's a fictitious town that he's describing here, but you know, I think you get the point. Um, it was a town of red brick or a brick that would have been red if the smoke and ashes had allowed it. But as matters stood, it was a town of unnatural red and black, like the painted face of a savage. It was a town of machinery and tall chimneys, out of which interminable serpents of smoke trailed themselves forever and ever and never got uncoiled. It had a black canal in it and a river that ran purple with ill-smelling dye and vast piles of building full of windows where there was a rattling and a trembling all day long and where the piston of the steam engine worked monotonously up and down. Kind of get the idea of where he's yeah. coming from. Uh, some interesting statistics with the impact of industrialization and its subsequent urbanization. Between 1783 and 1841, um, the population of British Isles will double to over 34 million. That's very fast. That's faster. They're going to change faster 
than the United States will as far as uh, agricultural to, ur to industrialization and urbanization. More than 60% of the people were less than 24 years old, and that's really young uh, by the 1840s. Population growth led to a dramatic rise in food and other prices. We talked last time about the hungry 40s. We'll talk about that more next time as well. Uh, dramatic exodus from the countryside. Only 22% of the workforce remained on the farms. That's a much lower percentage than we would see in the United States until about 1920, so a long way to go. Over 3,000 miles of railroad track by 1846. Um, Dickens at, at this point is um, 34 years old. Um, explosion of print culture with an easy distribution of, with an easy distribution develops. Um, and we'll talk about this. Um, now they're gonna have a much better postal system that rivaled anything anywhere on the continent or in the United States. The urbanization of London. Between 1714 and 1840, London's population swelled from 630,000 to nearly 2 million and 6.5 million by the end of the Victorian era, a phenomenal growth. New building and affluent development went hand in hand with horribly overcrowded and filthy slums. It did nothing to do slum renovations um, throughout most of the Victorian time period. England and Wales, the proportion of the population living in cities jumped from 17% in 1801 to 72% in 1891. Again, amazing. Disease and epidemics were rampant. Living in London was not a healthy place to live. Even if you lived in a nice neighborhood, life expectancy in 1850 was 37 years of age. It was much better in the United States in 1850, hmm. um, unless you were a slave. But, um, and this is why they didn't drink water. I mean, the water was disgusting and why they drank liquor and beer. And of course that practice would spread over to here too. <laughs> Fun fact, 11,000 handsome cats, like you see in, in the photograph, their horses, each horse of the produced at minimum of 15 pounds of horse manure a day. And that alone was a task that befuddled the city fathers for a long, long time as to what they were gonna do with manure removal. For a long time, it just was dumped in the Thames. Hence, the Thames was an open sewer. But they weren't just dumping manure into the Thames, they were dumping everybody's sewage and industrialization waste into the, a, uh, the Thames as well. Hmm. So this is a biggie. Dynamic changes in politics and economics. Quote, the success of the middle classes in the Victorian period can be seen in their ability to universalize a set of principles based on individuality and progress. And those are going to be kind of the watchwords of the middle class in England also on the continent, and then of course, also in the United States. And they would be kind of the driving engines for the middle class and, and what they were thinking and what they wanted to pursue as, as things moved forward. Here's a man that most people never heard of. Lovely, the first name, <laughs> Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Uh, he's an amazing individual. It's too bad he smoked cigars it shortened his life. Um, he died a relatively young man given his economic circumstances. He was an English civil, uh, civil engineer. Um, and what he produced for Great Britain was nothing short of amazing. Built dockyards, state of the art. He built the Great Western Railway, which was really the first major railway in England. Mm. He built the first transatlantic steamship. He, he was the first to tunnel under the Thames, in part for railroads, um, and important bridges all over England uh, to help move industrial product. And then this I didn't know until I was doing the research. He designed and built prefab hospitals to be used during the Crimean War, which we'll talk about later. His designs incorporated the necessities of hygiene, access to sanitation, ventilation, drainage, and even rudimentary temperature controls. I mean, this guy was way ahead of his time. He died with 8 million uh, pounds in the bank, which was pretty good considering his youth 
If he'd lived longer, he'd have made even more. And the key here is he's representative of the emerging upper middle class who most threatened the position of the aristocracy. Politics, I never get far without talking about politics. And there's, what we see here is a transition from liberal to radical legislation. Um, but it's, 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 it's not gonna happen overnight. And you know, plenty of political scientists today will argue that the most meaningful changes when it's gradual rather than rapid. Now, remember from last time, liberals represent the middle class and they represent the idea of opposing absolutism, reducing the power of the monarch, which they will get um, with the establishment of parliament and um, gradually chipping away at the power of the aristocracy, um, thanks in to a major degree because of the economic changes that occur due to industrialization. So the transition here, 1815, you have the Corn Laws, which I believe I mentioned last time. And the Corn Laws are part and parcel, part of the vision of, of the aristocracy. Uh, all the land that they own, they're in competition with cheap grain from the continent. They don't want to be competing with cheaper grain prices. So they throw up you know, a tariff wall, which is essentially what the corn laws are. It's a tariff on imported goods, which raises, keeps the price artificially high in Britain so that they're not losing money. But of course, they're screwing over the uh, poor and lower middle class who depend on grain much more than the middle and upper classes do uh, as a basic staple of food. But by 1828, the Test and Corporation Acts are repealed. This was the, I mean, religion, which we aren't going to talk about a whole lot, and it's a big deal in, in England. Um, and the Test and Corporation Acts had limited access to government for Anglicans only. All other Protestants, particularly Presbyterians, um, Methodists, etc., were kept out in the cold. That'll be repealed. Um, with in 1828. So all of a sudden now all Protestants, not Catholics, um, could have access to government. Uh, but one year later, Catholic emancipation, which is a huge thing when you consider the battles between the Protestants and the Catholics in England in their earlier history. In 1831, there's the first Factory Act, which, and then there's many Factory Acts. Uh, and this one is fitting night work for people under 21 years. So that's, this is kind of the first attempt to try to deal with the whole looming issue of, of child labor, which is just huge. Um, and then as I did talk about last time, the Reform Act is really the turning point. Uh, in 1832, for the first time, upper middle class um, would meet certain qualifications and they would be able to vote. Uh, so all of a sudden the House of Commons is going to have a lot more clout because it's going to include a lot more people who can now vote. Um, in 1832, we'll see the first chipping away of some power, not a whole lot, of the House of Lords. House of Lords is still in control. Um, 1834, the Poor Law Amendment Act, which again, we talked about last time, which establishes, of course, the, the work house uh, procedures and, and all the nasty things that went along with that. Uh, in 1837, the Registration Act limiting work hours for youth. Again, another um, attempt at some child labor reform. And then the biggie, and really kind of opens the dam, is the Corn Law repeal in 1846. So a lot, it shows you that within um, 30 years approximately, Great Britain is undergoing major transition, uh, in part because the radicals are pushing for greater demands. And the radicals are represented, if you remember last time, um, by the chartists and groups of that nature who are demanding all kinds of democratic small d uh, reforms that are gonna take a while to, uh, to take hold. Um, but 
those pressures are, are going to kind of force the hand of liberals, some liberals, and, and, and Charles Dickens will be an example, although he's not a politician, um, to move towards the middle between the liberals and the radicals. Um, and then as nasty as the poor law amendment was in 1834, in 1847, which is on, you know, not as nine years after Oliver Twist, finally the poor law board will be established, taking power out of the hands of the local um, parishes with those fat people sitting around their tables, stuffing themselves full of pork roasts and beef roasts. Uh, while the kids are eating gruel in, in the workhouse. And that's going to be the, the beginning of an improvement of the workhouse. Um, and there is no doubt that um, Oliver Twist, the novel, had an impact on all this because the Times of, of London is publishing excerpts of Oliver Twist. So even before some people were reading it, they were hearing about the, the you know, the excerpt. Um, Dickens has his opinion. He was a, you know, a court re reporter and then he was a reporter for Parliament. Um, and um, here's just a couple quotes about his opinion on, on uh, Parliament. Britannia, quote, Britannia, that unfortunate female, is always before me like a trussed fowl, skewered through and through with office pens and bound hand and foot with red tape. And a second quote, I have not the least hesitation in saying that I have the smallest amount of faith in the House of Commons. Um, class, there, you know, London is crowded, it's teeming, uh, it's growing, uh, and there are short distances separating class divisions. Kind of, you know, not unlike, although we don't have a, as, as formal a class system in Philadelphia, um, we have a de facto or, or did to some degree, and we still do. Um, in, in England, you could walk two blocks and, and cross all three of, of these sections. You have the slums, and a rookery was a, was a term used by uh, the Victorians um, to talk about the really nasty, dangerous neighborhoods um, the middle class and the upper class. And, you know, Peter Ackroyd's one of the, the significant biographers of Dickens um, said, Dickens opened up the world for those who were already living in it. So in other words, many Londoners, many Englanders didn't really know that much about their country and Dickens and his writings will help to expose all that. Um, sketches by Boz, which I'll mention again in a minute, um, certainly played a, a key role in that. Um, and I gave you an excerpt from one of his sketches, the shabby genteel, uh, which is a term he essentially came up with and popularized, um, and a description of an, an interesting type um, that lots of people had no idea about. Um, and I'm just quoting the last couple sentences that I gave you. Whether our readers have noticed these men in their walks as often as we have, we know not. This we know, that the miserably poor man, no matter whether he owes his distresses to his own conduct or that of others, who feels his poverty and vainly strives to conceal it, is one of the most pitiable objects in human nature. Such objects, with few exceptions, are shabby genteel people. Dickens created London as much as London creates Dickens. Um, it's so true. I mean, it's London is Dickens's muse. Uh, extremely important. Details that Londoners didn't even notice were now being noted. Like foreigners, Dickens noted the native customs and reproduced them. He created part of that you see in the dialogue. Like 
some people had no idea what the Cockney accent was. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get into the, the W versus the V in, in some of his writing when he's writing dialect. Um, he's one of the first to really introduce the use of dialect and popularize it. Uh, he created, he said, quote, a simple photograph in my mind. And Francis Parkman, one, a very, one of the great early American historians, um, visited and he, this is such a telling quote, I thought I had been there before. There in flesh and, flesh and blood, blood was the whole host of characters. Um, so he really revealed a lot. Um, and I'm gonna read one short little paragraph from Philip Collins, uh, one of the most significant uh, scholars of Dickens. He has just left us a few years ago. Um, speaking of London, within his self-imposed limits of a decent reticence, Dickens creates a convincing and accurate picture of the London underworld, rather overemphasizing the squalor and misery and suppressing its feckless jollity. Beyond its documentary value, which is considerable, the novel remains, of course, a powerful symbol of moral evil and darkness. Korpchank, the uh, illustrator for Oliver Twist, before Twist, um, drew this lithograph, which he sold, and it's a beehive. Um, and it's a symbol of kind of middle-class thinking um, at this time, and, and, and one that pretty much share, is shared, of course, by Dickens. And it, it's, it's a portrait of the social hierarchy. Um, and the bee was a symbol for industry and cooperation um, during the Victorian period. And um, Kurchank admires what he sees in, in the status quo. So you look at the top, of course, and it's the royal family and the aristocracy um, at the top of the pile. Mm -hmm. And in the middle, fortunes were made by manufacturing and trader trading goods. These, this is the, the bulk of, of the powerful, upwardly mobile middle class uh, who are helping to make change for the good uh, in the minds of many in uh, Victorian England. And then the, the hardworking, industrious working class. And then at the bottom, this is interesting, you might guess at the bottom is, is going to be the people that Dickens wants to help, but, but it's not. Um, it's the military, which I find interesting and, and curious. So this is a classic middle class image, this beehive of mm -hmm. what they see as what's good in England and what's going to carry them forth. And if you work hard, you can become successful. And Dickens buys into that. So you might have seen mentioned Boz. Um, Boz is a nickname that Dickens actually gave to his younger brother, Augustus. We won't get into how Boz evolves, but um, before Dickens is Dickens, he's Boz. And when um, people are reading the Pickwick papers and then reading the early parts of Oliver Twist, it's signed by Boz. And um, no one knows who Boz was. And I, it's telling um, that when Dickens emerges with his name, Charles Dickens, when he does, it, it, it illustrates how he's changed, um, how confident he's become, and his decision to see Oliver Twist through as an actual novel where it really wasn't at the start. Um, you know, by the time he's writing Twist, even in the form of the first eight sketches or seven sketches, um, he's become a social commentator. And um, he believed in the ethical and political potential of his novels. He saw fiction as a springboard for debates about moral and social reform. He strove to raise the collective awareness of his readers. And he was, for sure, uh, between the sketches by Boz which are all those pieces put together that illustrate the London that Dickens sees 
and in Oliver Twist. Twist portrays England as two nations, the splendorous life of Mr. Brownlow versus the slums, the macabre childhood that orphans had to suffer through, and the workhouse of middle-class vision was failing. Another example in, in the uh, sketches by Boz was a piece he wrote in 1835 before Twist started uh, called The Gin Shops. This is a illustration by Cruikshank, again, the illustrator for Twist. And um, just you know, one little quote from that. Gin drinking is a great vice in England, but wretchedness and dirt are a greater. And until you improve the homes of the poor or persuade a half famished wretch not to seek relief in the temporary oblivion of his own misery with the pittance which divided among his family would furnish a morsel of bread for each, gin shops will increase in number and splendor. So he's already you know, making his social commentary before twist. Okay, a little bit about characters. Doc, I'm almost done. Uh, Dickens okay. characters crossed class lines. Uh, I don't, if you haven't read the entire, uh, there's going to be a, uh, no, the major spoiler comes next week. But um, if, if you've read all of Twist, then you know both of these characters, uh, Rose and Nancy, um, two very different women. And we'll be talking more about Victorian women in, an, in another session. Um, a quote from Twist, lady, cried the girl, sinking on her knees, dear sweet angel lady, you are the first that ever blessed me with such words as these, and if I had heard them years ago, they might have turned me from a life of sin and sorrow, but it is too late, it is too late. It is never too late, said Rose, for penitence and atonement. Um, it, the classic middle class position here. And of course, Nancy is a prostitute. And Rose is, is uh, up, uh, solidly middle class. One of everybody's favorite characters, Mr. Bumble, um, which Dickens used is delightfully to illuminate absurdity and all kinds of things. So here he's uh, uh, trying to woo um, his future wife Whatever were Mr. Bumble's intentions, however, and no doubt they were of the best, it unfortunately happened, as has been twice before remarked, that the table was a round one. Consequently, Mr. Bumble, moving his chair by little and little, soon began to diminish the distance between himself and the matron. <laughs> you know, good juxtaposition here, the previous slide, you know, and a serious piece of social commentary and, and then the humor um, which Dickens was so good with and so well known for already because Pickwick Papers is essentially a humorous piece. It's not even really a novel. It's, a, it's really a collection of a, a travelogue of sorts of Mr. Pickwick traveling around England and getting himself into all kinds of circumstances, some good, some bad. Dickens exposes the underworld. Here, of course, this is a, a later, um, as I pointed out in the last set of slides, um, Dickens's novels would be illustrated and re-illustrated depending on the edition, well after he was not around. And uh, this is a 1910 um, illustration of Fagin and uh, Dodger uh, teaching or, or showing anyway, um, Oliver how to play a game. When the breakfast was cleared away, the merry old gentleman and the two boys played at a very curious and uncommon game, which was performed in this way. Of course, it's all about pickpockets. Dickens promoted bourgeois humanitarianism. Here we have Mr. Brownlow before the magistrate um, trying to uh, save Oliver from the dire circumstances he was in. It was the critical moment of Oliver's fate. If the inkstand had been where the old gentleman thought it was, he would have dipped his pen into it and signed the indentures and Oliver would have been straight away hurried off. Um, 
So he was saved from jail. Make no mistake about it. If Dickens was a reformer, he was also about making money and he's good at it. Dickens never forgot his father's chronic indebtedness, which we spoke about last time, and never forgave him for the blacking factory and the abandonment at age 12 when he had to leave school and work for approximately six months living on his own in the middle of London, in not a good neighborhood, um, while his father and mother and the other kids were in the um, debtor prison at Newgate. Fame, wealth, and comfort were personal goals. Dickens proudly assumed the role of professional author. It became essential to his identity. At 20 pounds per installment, Dickens earned 400 pounds with the Pickwick Papers between 1836 and 1837. That alone is a pretty good income for the time. Um, he could live fairly comfortably, actually very comfortably compared to a lot of other people with 400 pounds a year, but he wasn't done. Oliver Twist will earn him 500 pounds in approximately the same time frame, And by 1846, instead of 20 pounds per installment, he's getting paid 400 pounds per installment. And in 1847, Dickens received on top of all that, 5,726 pounds from his two publishers that he was working with in addition to all this income. And this is not all of it. There are other things which uh, partly I'll explain next time. Um, Dickens is an astute businessman. And the penny dreadful he understood to be a very successful venture. For a penny, a relatively modest person could, who had education um, could go out and buy a sensational, a sensational piece like this, um, kind of National Enquirer kind of thing. Uh, they were cheap, popular serial literature, meaning they, in this case, they came out weekly in eight to 16 pages with pictures. Remember, there's no TV, uh, no radio. So pictures were exciting, particularly for the lower classes who couldn't afford books, each costing one penny. Subject matter of these stories was typically sensational, focusing on the exploits of detectives, criminals, or supernatural entities. So there's no surprise knowing about Penny Dreadfuls and their success that Dickens is going to turn to serialization because he understands that people who couldn't afford a book could afford, in this case, two shillings for one of his pieces or one of the Bentley miscellany magazines, uh, journals that were monthly, um, and read all kinds of articles plus you know, uh, his sketch. Uh, and those sketches would continue, as if you read my handout for this week, um, through September of 1837. And it was in November of 1837, well, September to October, that he had come to a decision that he was going to turn Twist into a novel. And before that, he wasn't sure. Uh, and that's why there's going to take a dramatic change, uh, which we'll be talking about, uh, with um, number eight on. And each number usually was two chapters. And when he was firing all cylinders, each, each chapter was approximately 12 to 16 pages. Sometimes he fell a little short. Um, the cover on the right-hand side here is actually, if you see the date, 1846. He's going to republish in, in serial format uh, um, uh, another run of Oliver Twist. Um, in fact, there'll be other formats as well. Uh, like I said, he's an astute businessman and he's making money. By 1846, He's extremely wealthy. So what do, we do, what do we know? The emergence of the middle class was impacting politics based upon its emphasis on the ideals of self-reliance and hard work. Urbanization, the result of industrialization was creating significant social tensions in London and elsewhere throughout Great Britain. Parliament was embracing social and economic reforms at a gradual pace beginning in 1832 with the Reform Act. And Dickens remained true to his middle-class roots, but pressured for reforms for the deserving downtrodden while garnering personal wealth and fame. 
And with that, are there any questions on my part? And it's okay if there aren't. Doc, I take that silence for what it is. I turn it Thank over you. to you. Thanks. Thanks for the intro. Hey, everybody. So um, if there's anything I value in life more than honesty, it might be kindness to animals. But I have to say that I'm very, very appreciative of those of you who have contacted me lamenting the fact that you are behind in the reading. Some of you are in some respect remarkably behind in the in the reading. Um, and I tried to do a little bit of um, calculation today, but it seemed that for some of you, if you're at the same pace, uh, the course would have to extend till a little bit before Thanksgiving. So what I'm gonna do is ask you to read as much as you can and to try to, try to as, as a goal, get to page 213 for next week, okay? Now, this, this change of heart on my part occurred only this week. So as I was preparing for tonight, I was all over the book. Now, I don't want to cramp your style. So if, in fact, you have read the whole book and you want to bring in stuff from the, from the uh, you know, latter part, well, that's, you know, do it. Why not? Okay, we'll catch up eventually. All right. So now we're going to start off with uh, Blake's London. I, as I, I will always do, is there anyone who would care to read the poem with feeling or would you prefer me to do it? I'll go, Doc. All right, all right, man, you go for it. London by William Blake. I wandered through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldiers sigh, runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlots curse, blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. Nicely done, thank you. Um, so I'd like all of you for a couple of minutes, take out a pen or any kind of implement, um, circle important uh, words, particularly. Lines are okay too, but words particularly. And look for any trends. Like, does he seem to be doing something is, is he pointing us in a particular direction through technique? One thing you'll notice, um, I'll blather a little bit while you look. One thing you'll notice in this, um, in the poem is that there's really very little description of London itself. Um, you know, I mean, Dickens is all over that, like white on rice, but London, London is focused more on the denizens of London. Okay, so does anybody, has anybody circled anything that they think is particularly pithy to uh, share? Uh, I see a hand up. Yes. Just, you just got to spit it out. Okay, don't just interrupt me anytime you want. I mean, I don't, I have no feelings, you know. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't know if uh, it was my hand or someone else's hand, it but- It doesn't there's... matter. It doesn't okay. matter. All right, we'll go with my hand then. Um, it seems like there's a lot of talk about the senses, like voices, hearing, cries, tears, especially. So I think it's a lot of, he's invoking a lot of sound 
uh, terminology and um, more, much more feeling, like he's trying to bring you in through your senses. Yeah, that's my first well, blush. You just got a table slap, which is a, you know, a congratulations from me. This Thank is you. Oh, good. I remember this. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so here's the thing. You you are so right. This is uh, this is an auditory poem. This is a story, or this is a poem that we hear, right? As much as well. Now here's before we get to other pithy points that you're gonna uh, that that you're gonna make. Let me here's a little test, kind of like a quiz. And there's a table slap waiting for the person who gets the right answer. Okay. There is, I will explain what it, in case you've forgotten, what an acrostic is. Acro an acrostic is a poem, a word puzzle, or an arrangement of letters to form a word. What, where do we see this in the poem? In, uh, you see here, nine, 10, 11, and 12. Okay, you got it. Um, yes. And so, everything that we've said so far about the auditory nature of the of the poem is almost you know is emphasized in that acrostic now that actually i did i never recognized that until one of my ga 10th graders noted it for me unfortunately none of the former scholars who were among the group tonight was <laughs> the person who thought of this okay however uh kudos to you um now how about some other other specific words diction specific um techniques uh, how about mind forged manacles yes what do you make of that um i don't know uh metaphorical imprisonment uh oh my god you guys sort? you guys you guys are cooking tonight okay this is actually, <laughs> okay um yeah absolutely and think about look for other um uh words that suggest some kind of imprisonment the marriage hearse mm -hmm. What's a chartered street? Any controlled? Ideas? Controlled, yeah. I mean, it means, it, you know, one definition is that it's mapped. It's a mapped street. But of course, when we map areas out, we're putting borders and boundaries and restrictions on them. Okay. Anything else that you see there? Uh, the alliteration of like worrisome and woe, you know, marks of worry, marks of woe. Excellent, excellent. Oh boy. Okay. All right. What What does the word ban mean? In, in every ban, in line seven. In okay, in every I you know Richard I don't know. Isn't a ban like what they post for marriage, the marriage bans? Oh. <sighs> Okay, thanks, Jenny. I'm telling you. It's you. Would we do that, without being here? Okay. That, that um, word us that word usually has two ends, though, doesn't it? I guess it's just a different spelling of the same word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, of the, I'm going to say one thing that you know to me that that really is striking, just because it moves the poem, and that is repetition each chartered street, chartered Thames, every cry, every infant's cry, every voice, right? Um, and that, you know, that's pushing us to see the kind of the intensity of Blake's um, know, social commentary here. You know, it was written in 1794, so industrialism and the movement to the city was, you know, I mean, it, it, it certainly was in high gear at that time. Now, here's a question for you. How, why do you think he uses the word appalls? What, what, what do you see in that word? Well, and why so, is that church black? Because <laughs> there's soot everywhere. Got it, okay. 
but the appalls is even like appalls or as a Paul falls over something like casting a Paul. Mm -hmm. So we can use it both ways. It's appalling, but it's also a Paul that brings the blackness oh. on everything. Yeah. Great moment of cleverness there. Okay, so here's another meaning of the word Paul. And this is something, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, English teachers will look up. Um, it's a heavy cloth covering a covering for a coffin. So again, the images of death, um, you know, you know, you know, permeate the poem. And what about the marriage hearse? I mean, you, you know, we all get the youthful harlots cursing. And, and that curse blasts the newborn infant's tear. Blights with plague. Plagues the marriage hearse. Because marriage is dead because people are more interested in the harlots and having kids out of wedlock and <laughs> marriage doesn't go on anymore. I mean. <laughs> well, and also think about this. Um, what, do, what do some marriages produce? Dead kids. <laughs> Well, in the, dead kids in, at that time, I mean, it's like more children time, died than lived. Right? I mean, it's like, you know, it's not like happy times ahead for many of the, you know, the, the children of marriages, you know, at all, right? Um, I was thinking, prostitution, I was, prostitution could be a result of marriage. Yes. I was thinking that the, um, that in all those circumstances of children, dying and crying and the dirt and the soot and the you know the, uh, the sadness of the whole the whole poem is sad that what kind of marriage could ever be happy in yeah. those in those circumstances i mean just the the odds are so you know impossible very good and and you know it's almost like so many different elements of society i mean you've got the church the soldiers the harlots marriage are you know there's, there's really nothing good about uh, Blake's world here. Um, so, and as, as Kendall pointed out, when Dickens talks about the city, you know, there's not much good there. Um, I mean, you know, it's sort of like, I think, geez, you know, I've been to London, you know, I, I, it's, it, you know I'm not like terrified by the darkness and by the, you know, creepiness of it, but, you know, he obviously this is part of his of his shtick um, is to create London that way. Okay, so I thought that the next we would focus on these defining moments as well as class, and if we have time, a little smidgen on the images of the country versus the city. Now, if you're, you know, you have to be sort of later on in the, in the, uh, in the novel uh, and to be at the, at Mrs. Maley's country house to really get a, a full flavor of that. So anyway, so I guess defining moment, you know, if, if you're a Joseph Campbell fan, they're kind of related to the hero's journey. The hero's journey is made up of a bunch of defining moments um, so first I'd like to, you know, ask you about defining moments that you see during the novel for Oliver. I mean, to me, there are a lot of defining moments for other characters as well, particularly Nancy, even Bill, um, uh, and, uh, and poor Bumble, who, you know, falls out of his, you know, close to middle class state with with his um, with his wife. Um, but you know, Oliver obviously, he's our focus. He's not to me, you know, a particularly compelling or interesting character. Um, you know, of course we sympathize with him. He's had a shitty life. I mean, how can you not? Right? But um, in a way, somebody like Nancy is more interesting to me. 
because we, there's more complexity in her character. Now, but, but let's, again, we, we're gonna get to Nancy a lot when we do crime and women. Um, and um, so we'll, we'll hold up on, on her. How about Oliver? Where do you see the big moments occurring? Go anywhere you want. Anywhere up to which, up to the point of which you've uh, read. What, what about when he sees, uh, he sees the portrait in, uh, in, the, in the room of, uh, and, and he recognizes his own face in there? That's so good, yes, yes. And so why is that important? Well, that's who he's, who he is. That's, there's, there's where he comes from. And he just, re well, he doesn't realize it, but we do as the reader. Yeah, I mean, but, and, and we find out eventually, you know, mm -hmm. we don't know really right then. You know, we know that, you know, do we? I mean, we kind of do, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know, you know, but I, I think that he's certainly still in this phase where something is being triggered, right? And um, so in a way it's a kind of foreshadowing, isn't it, for him? I, I was struck, Peter, yeah. by how, how seldom Oliver himself is an agent in his, of his own life. It, it seemed to me as, I think part of my frustration as I, as I read through the novel was that it seems that most of the time things were just happening to him. That uh, Once in a while, I mean, like the famous scene where he asks for more, uh, he's he does act, but much of the time he's he's the victim of other circumstances around him, but not the but not the not the agent. So although he's the although he's the title, the titular character, he's um, he's on the receiving end rather than the acting much of the time. So I, I agree with you. I'm more, much more interested in other characters. In the end, I'm more interested in other characters than in Oliver himself. Okay, that, thanks Richard. That's, that's an interesting point of view. Um, I'm gonna kill somebody if this phone keeps, uh, keeps ringing. So he, is there a reason why, in a sense, he couldn't be anything else than what you described? Because he's a kid. A, he's a kid. Good. He doesn't know where he comes from yet, right? He has no idea where he comes from, his heritage, who he is, where he's come from, any of it. And so, in a way, his passivity is partly a result of who he is as far as he, who he knows he is, right? Which is not much, right? But he said nothing good happened to him. So he's, you know, his whole, he can't be an agent because he, he never is in charge of anything. People pass him around, you know, like an old dish or something from one person to the next to get rid of him. He doesn't know what to do. But I thought his, uh, one of the defining moments I saw was when he chose to take the books back for Mr. Brownlow that sort of set in motion the whole disaster of being recaptured by Sykes and Nancy and the whole crew. And had he not advocated himself to please let me take those books back, um, he could have stayed with Brownlow and been very happy and they might have avoided all the disaster that came. Yeah, and of course, why does he want to bring the books back? I mean, to show why? what a great kid he is. Or? And... No, he's a catalyst. Everything happens because of him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he wants to also show his great appreciation. Right. The brown look. You know, it's like, I, I got to do something now. And that's kind of a, a sign of, of, of his growth. I mean, if the hero's journey is sort of little points of growth, that's showing some growth. Because after all, when has he known kindness? Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, uh -huh. very, very good. Well. Hmm? Sorry, the only thing he has is his integrity. He really has nothing else. He, even his name is not really his own name. Didn't Mr. Beetle create that? He had like a 
it was almost a personal joke how he named these orphans. Right. Well, Mr. Brownlow and others think that his name is not Oliver Twist. And at one point, there's that moment where, it's like on page 93, where this is, you know, I, to me, this is, this is one of the, the defining moments because Brownlow says, Tom White, huh? My name is Oliver, sir, replied the little invalid with a look of great astonishment. Oliver, Oliver what? Oliver White? No, sir. Oliver Twist, this great moment. Okay, this is who I am. Okay. Um, and of course, the rest of the novel in a way is, is to show us who he becomes, right? Um, other other uh, defining moments that you think are big deals. How about when he thrashes Noah? <laughs> you have to love him when he's thrashing Noah, you know, and then, and, uh, you know, Noah is, uh, he's such a wuss. Um, on uh, 48, or I think it's 48. He'll murder me, blubbered Noah. Charlotte, missus, here's the new boy a murdering me. Help, help, Oliver's gone mad. Charlotte. That's a big deal. He acts aggressively. He thrashes it. And then, what does he do after that? What's the big decision? What's the defining moment? He leaves. He leaves. He leaves. <laughs> he leaves. Whoa. And this is to explore a totally new world. There was wonderful descriptions of his, sort of his initial thoughts about London, how he's taking in this new world, like on um, the, okay. Let's see. I'm looking for the, the, just the passage where he embarks. Um, on his journey, you know what I'm talking about. It's just, it just comes, it comes right after. Talking the, about page fifty-seven, Doc, right at the beginning of chapter eight. Yes, excellent, Kendall. All right, oh, at the I bottom, know. London, that great large place. Nobody, not even Mr. Bumble, could ever find him there. He had often heard the old men in the workhouse too say that no lad of spirit need want in London and that there were ways of living in that vast city which those who had been bred up in country parts had no idea of. It was the very place for a homeless boy. And that's great because it shows both his naivete and Dickens, you know, sense of irony, right? Um, one more defining moment before we move move on. I'm going to give you one that's them, and I'm sorry because it's it's for some of you it's it's really late or late. It's on 272, and this is when Rose is very ill, and he they think she's going to die, and. He thinks to himself at the top of 272, he had no cause for self-reproach on the score of neglect or want of thought, for he had been devoted to her service. And yet a hundred little occasions rose up before him on which he fancied he might have been more zealous and more earnest and wished he had been. To me, that's like, you know, okay, there's a certain maturity there because he's feeling guilt and i think you know guilt yeah little kids you know they can feel guilt but you know when you're getting older and you're i mean i should know i mean my therapist calls me captain guilt but um 
you know, that's, you know, it seems to me that there's another little turning point. So he is growing, he's growing. He's not an active person in a way, as Richard pointed out, but he is still growing. Okay, let's do a quick shift to class. And um, if you were once obsessed with the show, upstairs, downstairs, or recently, and I certainly was with Downton Abbey. There's just some wonderful, wonderful looks at class in that, in, you know, in, in, in that, in those shows. Um, and interestingly to see the various breakdowns, even within say the downstairs, they're not all the same. And the upstairs is not, you know, is not all the same. So, what particular class elements do you see it working here in um, in the novel as for again anywhere you want to be so I thought he does a lot to, with class by the setting where people are like when they're with the lower class everything is dirty and noisy yeah. and dark and horrible and he has some amazing descriptions of just London in those areas, it's loud, it's, you know, there's animals, there's a page 171 has a great paragraph where he describes going through the marketplace. And then oh my God, where, yeah. where it's nice, it's quiet and it's sunny and it's flowers, you know, that when he's in the country, he's gathering flowers every day or he's at Mr. Brownlow's and it's sunny and nice in the room. So he sort of denotes that every time you're with the lower class it's dirty and dark and horrible and when you're with the upper class it's sunny and nice and there's fresh air and everything's lovely yeah and like on page 234 um he go this is when he's in this this is after all the ruckus involved by his being you know caught as the alleged thief in mrs maylie's house and now we're actually in the house it's in uh chapter the seventh um in a handsome room, though its furniture had rather the air of old fashioned comfort than of modern elegance, there sat two ladies at a well spread breakfast table. Mr. Giles, dressed with scrupulous care in a full suit of black. There's a little class thing there because of the servants, he's, he thinks of himself, and in fact, he is kind of the big shot. Okay, so it's important that he has the full suit of black was in attendance upon them. He had taken his station some halfway between the sideboard and the breakfast table, you know, doing the proper, doing the proper thing. And with his body drawn up to its full height, his head thrown back and inclined the merest trifle on one side, his left leg advanced and his right hand thrust into his waistcoat <laughs> while his left hung down by his side, grasping a waiter looked like one who labored under a very agreeable sense of his own merits and importance. So it's, you know, it's, it's not the upper, upper class here. It's more upper middle. I mean, there's no elegance, but certainly it's comfortable and they do have the, the, the country house. So I think that's a, that's a very clear, and it's also really along with Brownlow, you know, Oliver's only um, experience with, with that class. Where else do you see class playing a, an, an important part? There are a lot of um, subtleties of, of difference in class in Mrs. Maylie's house, just in her house alone. You've got mm -hmm. those two servants that you do realize there's a hierarchy yeah. to them. One had been in service since he was a child. Um, then you've got Mrs. Maley. You've got her son, who I think is in Parliament, or he's some type of. He's political. running for Parliament. Okay, he's, and then yeah. you don't know who Rose is. She calls her her niece, but then you realize she's not her niece, and Rose doesn't really know what class she is, because Rose is. There's this question of her birth and were her parents married and who were her parents, and so Mrs. Maley makes this assumption of a higher class, but they don't know. And Rose certainly herself feels she will bring down Ro uh, Rose's, uh, Mrs. Maley's son if she were to marry him. There's a ton of really important class discussion by Dickens 
in these in the sections either you know once he has been rescued from being the alleged thief and has taken care of the Maleys both there at the at, at the city home and also the country home and uh, when um, when we talk about both women and crime um, I'm going to take a closer look at those sections but those those are you know Dickens really goes to town on class there where else does he where else do you notice who did you say to yourself okay so he is making a very clear comment on class any of the classes i mean like who, I, what, what class is bumbling i was just going to say about bumble so he's interesting about his class as pricked the shabby genteel about the outfit means mm -hmm. everything to him like he had the great coat and the great hat Oh, yeah. And then he moves to head of the workhouse and now he's got like a round hat and he's not got the great coat anymore with the brass buttons. And that he's often talking about like his his importance. Uh, there's a great line somewhere like what, you know, the nerve you questioned a beetle. Could somebody have asked me, you know, I could you I could know. say that to me. How could that happen? Um, he very much sees his clothes as representing his class and sees him above everybody else in his station. But as he moves along, especially after he gets married, he realized He's dropped down quite a bit after Mrs. Corny gets a hold of him and <laughs> changes his whole life around. I love well, when he I'm, says, I traded this all in for like seven teaspoons and a silver pitcher. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's great. On page 136, this is a description of Bumble and what he thinks of himself. Um, top of the page, he was in the full bloom and pride of beetleism. His cocked hat <laughs> and coat were dazzling in the morning sun, and he clutched his cane with all the vigorous tenacity of health and power. Mr. Bumble always carried his head high, but this morning it was higher than usual. There was an abstraction in his eye and an elevation in his air, which might have warned an observant stranger that thoughts were passing in the beetle's mind too great for utterance. Mr. Bumble stopped not to converse with the small shopkeepers and others who spoke to him deferentially as he passed along. He merely returned their salutations with a wave of his hand, right? The perfect example, I mean, so he's the social climbing, you know, I mean, you know, I was trying to put him into like shabby uh, genteel land. And I guess he's never, he's never quite as down and out looking as the way shabby genteel is described, but certainly that 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 desire to appear more than he is 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 so important. And and of course, with um, you know, with, with his love and future wife, same thing, right? Um, uh, she she also is, is so in. Uh, so focused on on the appearance. He's a, he's a sad figure in that respect, isn't he? He's he's sort of he's desperately trying to hang on, but in the end doesn't succeed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We, we feel pity pity for him, although he's also a bully. That's it. Yeah. I mean he's you know you have to you know yeah you feel sorry for him but then it's like yeah, you deserve it. You know, you know, you're, you know, you're really kind of a puffed up jerk. Um, so when, do you think that Bill Sykes shows any class consciousness, particularly early on in the, in the early-ish? Like, what is the, you know, is, is the criminal a kind of class in the book? And, and what characterizes the criminals that we see? I just felt like Fagin's whole gang was constantly trying to use each other or use everybody else as pawns to advance themselves. And the lower the class, the more they were using people and uh, showed no mercy at all. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, and uh, we're going to have to wrap it up. Time to wrap it up. Finish your thoughts. I just want to get that in there. Okay. 
God sakes. Okay, well, just time just went, went flying. Um, so, are there any questions as we wrap it up? Could have finished that point. Kendall, when you speak, I listen. <laughs> okay. okay, there is no question about it. <laughs> we'll get to it next week. I mean, like, what you know, what's the big deal? All right. Okay, Doc. Hey. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. You're welcome. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank, Thank you, everyone, you. for joining Thank us. You. Hope Thank you. See, hope to see you next week. So, All, right. All right. See you guys next week. This was Thank a great class, so everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.